All right. All right, last week we started a, a series of sermons uh, on strongholds, uh, the battleground. We talked last week about the battleground of the mind, and we tried to identify uh, one of our enemies, amen, and that was the, uh, that's the, the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, Satan. And so we talked about uh, the, 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 the battlefield, the, the number one, the, the first battlefield being the battlefield of the mind and how the enemy desires to gain access into our lives through our thought life and un the uncrucified thought life. And he's looking for ways to gain access so, because if he can get us to think certain ways, he can get us to be a act certain ways. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And if we begin to think a certain way, then we'll begin to act out the thing that we think. But it always begins with a thought. Amen. That's why the Bible tells us we got to take every thought captive. I think we're in a season right now, and I think God sets all this up. He orchestrates these things, but that he wants us to be aware of these truths because we're going into a season of, of great divisiveness, great division. Uh, listen, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. Somebody said amen. We're getting ready to go into a season where I, I saw in 2020 the enemy come in and wreak havoc in the church because people got so divided and caught up in worldly things that they lost their focus on heavenly things. And so we got to stay the course and keep our eyes fixed. But we have an adversary. Today I want to talk about the stronghold of the godly, and that's humility. Humility is the stronghold of the godly. Uh, one, one definition, I think Holman's Bible def, uh, dictionary says that humility is the personal quality of being free from arrogance and pride and having an accurate estimate uh, uh, of oneself, have, uh, one's worth. And so to having the proper uh, uh, estimate, evaluation of one's own self is what humility is about. And it's being free from arrogance and pride. Before I go any further, I want to pray. I feel like I need to pray over this. We're going to talk about some very good, important things. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask right now that as we move forward into this message, that, Lord God, you would give the words, the clarity, Lord, that you would speak to all of our hearts, that we would be challenged, but we'd also be encouraged. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Uh, Andrew Murray, who was a great pastor, author of the 1800s, late 1800s, he wrote humility, and he wrote a lot on humility. He wrote, humility is the displacement of self by the enthronement of God. Where God is all, self is nothing. And if God is all, then self is nothing. And the more we replace self through humility, the more God is enthroned in our hearts and our lives. Um, uh, Francis Frangipan, who wrote the book, The Three Battlegrounds, he says this, Satan fears virtue. He's terrified of humility. He hates it. He sees a humble person and it sends chills down his back. His hair stands up when Christians kneel down. For humility is the surrender of the soul to God. The devil trembles before the meek because in the very areas where he once had access, there's, there stands the Lord and Satan is terrified of Jesus Christ. And wherever the Lord reigns in the areas of our heart, where the, the Lord is present in those areas, Satan is terrified. Because Satan, does, he, he has to bow even himself at the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even dem demons tremble at that name. Amen. But here's the question I have. And who are we truly fighting? Who are we truly fighting? Uh, at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, uh, the judgment of God against the devil was that he would eat dust. And we know that when we read the account in Genesis, that when the serpent came to tempt Adam and Eve, or to tempt Eve to, to uh, break the, the word of God, to disobey God's command, that he came to her in, and he, in the form of a serpent. And the Bible says that he came to her into uh, doing something that was against what God said. And the Bible says after God had brought the judgment down, when he judged the serpent, he said that you will crawl on your belly the rest of your life and dust you shall eat. And so we know if we, just by reading that text, that the serpent wasn't always what we know it to be today. Some believe the serpent was upright. Some believe the serpent was beautiful. Some believe it was a creature that was totally different than what it is today. And yet the Lord said, you shall eat dust and dust shall you eat eat all the days of your life. But God also said of man, he said, you are dust. You're basically dirt, man. And man is basically dirt. What does he say in Genesis 3, 4, uh, 3 uh, 19? He says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until, till, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust. And, 
and dust you shall re- and to dust you shall return. So the essence of our carnal nature, of all that it is, all that the carnal nature is, is dust. It's literally, that's what the carnal nature is. And this is something we need to make a connection with, right? Satan feeds upon our earthly carnal nature of dust. And Satan dines on whatever we withhold from God. Whatever area we, we talked about this last week, whatever area we withhold from God, Satan has access to those areas. He has a legal right to darkness. Amen. He operates in the domain of darkness. We were brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so whatever area that is uncrucified in our life, the enemy has access to those areas or tries to gain access to those areas. That's why he said to Peter or to Jesus, that Jesus said to Peter, Satan is desired to sift you. Like wheat, because Peter had pride in his heart. Um, as, we, as we talk, listen, this, this is important to look at, right? It's very, very important to look at. The immediate source of many of our problems and oppressions is not demonic, but fleshly in nature. Our bigger battle and fight is with the flesh. When the, when the enemy tries to eat on or, des, or devour us through the appetites of the flesh, that's the way he tries to, to seduce us and tries to tempt us and by appealing to the flesh nature, but our greatest enemy is the flesh. That's why we can't say, and we've often heard it said, well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You just wanted to do it, and you did it. Amen. He might have tempted you with something, but you did what you wanted to do because that's just what you wanted to do. You were operating out of the flesh, out of the old nature. Our flesh will always be a target of the devil. And we've got to be honest with ourselves. When we evaluate ourselves in our hearts, we've got to be honest with this, Right? Uh, and, and, and it's very important that an exaggerated sense of self-righteousness prevents us from looking honestly at ourselves. The Bible's got a lot to say about self-righteousness. We are created in the likeness and image of God, but in our fallen old nature, too often we try to justify who we are, and, 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 and that's important. But this is what the Bible says about self-righteousness. Romans 10, verse 3. And you're saying, Pastor, what has any of this got to do with humility? We're going to get to that in just a second. But Romans 10, 3 says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. But Paul's talking in the book of Romans about they, they believed in their own righteousness. They exalted themselves and thought that they were good enough of themselves. And he said their self-righteousness is not, a, is not good enough. They didn't seek or, or they were ignorant of God's righteousness. Romans 3.10 says that none is righteous, no, not one. There's none righteous, none. Amen. And Titus 3.5 says he has saved us not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. We are not righteous in and of ourselves, but too often... We have a higher estimation of our own righteousness than we ought to have. That's why people, you'll hear people often say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm a good person. Or I, people will say, well, I'm, 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 I, know, I, I don't think I would go to hell or God would reject me because I'm a good person. I don't do everything perfectly, but I'm a good person. And people tend to look at themselves and evaluate their goodness by their, what they do and what they don't do. And the reality is there's none righteous. When we stand before a holy, perfect, righteous God, we have nothing to justify in, our, in of ourselves anything that's good. There's none righteous. Jesus said this in another place when the man came to him and said, good teacher. Jesus, being good, said to the man challenging his thinking, said, why do you call me good? There's none good but our Father who is in heaven. We can have good attributes and good characteristics, but at the end of the day, when we compare our righteousness to God's righteousness, there, we can't stand in light of that, right? And so we gotta be careful not to exaggerate our own, self sense of, our, our own sense of self-righteousness. I thought about this even after preaching the message this past week, going through these last several weeks, Lord, reveal to me, turn the spotlight on my heart to the pride that's in my life. I like to think that I'm a pretty humble guy and I can get along with anybody and I'm easy going. But man, get me in the car with my wife and she starts telling me how to drive and man, something comes out of me. There's something inside of there that I don't really like myself. And I'm trying to justify my driving to my wife. I'm a grown man. You can't talk to me. You tell me. I, that, 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 that. And I begin to say things that just are just, and I'm thinking to myself, it's like I'm having this out of body and I'm listening to myself speak and I'm thinking, about, who is that guy? 
And I think sometimes we tend to look at the, the, the faults of other people, but we don't, we don't do enough self-inspection on our own faults. And we need to understand that the enemy operates in the areas or tries to gain access. Spiritual warfare is about trying to bring people into captivity and erect strongholds in the lives of God's people, right? And so as, and so as believers, we've been, we've been saved, we've been redeemed, but we've got to be careful we got to take heed lest we fall, right? The Bible says pride cometh before a fall. And so being, uh, being um, careful to look at our own selves and know that none of us are righteous in and of ourselves and nothing that we do merits our, merits our relationship with God. Nothing we do causes us to come into a relationship with him. We're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we go on from that to do good works. Why? Because now Christ lives in us and we produce good works because we want to be like Jesus. And the more we grow in him and the more fruits in our life, we're being more and more like Jesus. We're to do good works through faith, in faith, but it's not good works that gets us anything right with God. All right. Does that make sense? I think about this in the context of the parable of the tax collector and the, uh, and the, and the Pharisee. In, in the book of Luke, they went up to the temple. Jesus is telling this, par- this parable. And he, he's trying to address the, the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. And he says there was two that went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. He was religious. He prayed so many times a day and fasted so many times a week and gave so much money in the offering plate. The other man that came up was a tax collector. The tax collector now, he was considered in that culture, in that custom, uh, in those customs, he was considered the, the dog of dogs. He was a betrayer of his people. He took the money and the resources of God's people and he gave it to their enemy, the Roman government. He was considered a traitor. He was considered scum to them. And Jesus is given this parable of these two and he's comparing these two together. And they both go up to the temple. One, the, ta- the Pharisee comes forward to the front and he begins to pray to God and he begins begins to exalt himself in the presence of God and the presence of the tax collector. He begins to say things like, I am so glad that I'm not like that wicked tax collector. I'm so glad, Lord, that I pray so many times a day and I give so, so much a week and I fast so many times a week and I'm not like him. And the Bible says that the, Jesus says, and the tax collector standing in the back with his head down in a, in a spirit of, uh, of, of, of uh, contrition says, oh Lord, forgive me, I'm a wicked unworthy, slothful, uh, wicked servant, a person. Just, Lord, how can you see, how can you justify me? And the Bible says that Jesus looked at them and said, who went home justified that day? That's a powerful thought when you think about it, especially when we compare ourselves in the light of the culture today. We can come into this house week after week after week, and we can begin to compare ourselves to those that don't serve the Lord and say, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm doing pretty good. But at the end of the day, we need to come before the Lord not in uh, uh, beating ourselves down and, 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 and not that debasing ourselves, but having a proper perspective that, Lord, without you, I'm nothing. Without you, God, I'm not righteous because it's your righteousness, not mine, right? Uh, we, need to know who, we know who's in us, but we also need to know what's in us. And that's important. We know who's in us. When we got saved, Jesus came to live in us. But we also need to know that what's in us, there's some things that are still in us, some pride, some arrogance, some self-righteousness. The Bible says in James chapter four, verse seven, submit yourselves to God. Therefore, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We have to be humble before the Lord in submission to God before the devil has no place in our life. He's afraid of humility. But when I try to justify anything that I'm doing, we're going to get into this in just a little bit deeper, but it's important to understand that, that we walk in humility. Submission to God is the first and foremost enemy, the adversary, right? And overcoming the flesh. We have three adversaries that the scripture tells us about. And we talked about the devil last week. We're talking about the flesh this week. And to overcome it, we have to be submissive to God. To overcome the devil and to overcome the flesh, it starts with submission to God. We wage war against the enemy. But we have to be specific when we submit ourselves to God. We've got to be specific. My tongue, just pray for my tongue. It gets loose today. Uh, pray, my sister Jody told me about getting pinto beans and cornbreads later for dinner, and I'm just got, that's probably got my mind rattled right So thanks a lot, Jody. It's your fault. But we have to be so specific when we talk about the things that we want to submit to God. We've got to tell the Lord, Lord, this area, I want you to have lordship over 
this area of my life. See, God wants us to bring everything to him. Here's the thing about the Lord. There's a verse in the Old Testament, and we even quoted it during worship, that uh, God is the great exchanger. He takes the bad from us, and he gives us good. We're to give God in exchange the things that are not good in our life, and he takes and gives us his, his, his character, his likeness, his glory. Amen. And so submit to God. Um, and, don't re- and we can't rationalize our sins and failures. Too often people try to do that. I mean, I have had so many counseling sessions where I've sat down with people. And when we get to the root of the problem and to the, the, the real crux of the problem, they have a hard, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes they have a hard time with owning the thing that they do and they try to rationalize the why they did the thing that they did. And God says to us today, we can never rationalize when we act out of character and act out of the, out of the character of God away from the character of God. We can't rationalize it away. If we're not careful, we, if we try to rationalize our sins and our failures, then we're gonna be deceived by the enemy. And then he'll have access into our life. He is the, he, he's a deceiver, right? right? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a perfect shelter of grace, enabling all men to look honestly at their needs. We gotta be honest before God. And here's the thing about being honest before God. There's nothing you can say or I can say that will shock the Lord. There's nothing I did last night that doesn't shock the Lord, that will shock the Lord. There's nothing I did 10 years ago that nobody ever found out about that shocks the Lord. He knows it all. And the Lord desires for his children through humility and surrender to him to come with the things that they deal with because we're engaged in a struggle and we want to have victory in our lives. We want to walk in victory. We have the victory. We want to walk in that victory. We have to overcome the enemy of our souls, and and it starts by overcoming the flesh. And so for us to do that, we have to be honest with the Lord with the things that we're struggling with. And here's the thing we need to remember. If God loved us when we were doing wicked things and saved us when we were wicked and vile, how much more is he gonna love us when we're struggling with wicked things and we bring them to him and say, Lord, here I am. I want rid of this thing in my life. I, I am, I'm falling prey to this all the time in my life and it's keeping me defeated And the Lord said, if you just bring it to me and lay it at my feet, and you say, well, I've done that, Pastor. Well, then do it again. Well, I've done it more than one time. We'll do it more more and more and more. Keep doing it until the breakthrough comes. Keep doing it until relief comes. Don't stop. Keep moving. Keep believing. and Keep asking the Lord, and breakthrough's gonna come. Praise God. Praise God. And before we can launch into aggressive spiritual warfare in our lives, we gotta realize uh, that uh, many of our battles are merely the consequences of our own actions. This is a true statement right here. People need healing, right? There are many people that are dealing with stuff. We need to pray. Uh, my, uh, my Aunt Barbara, who's uh, Savannah Trinity's grandma, who's Sherry Ann's mom and Becky's mom, uh, is going through something in her body right now. They're doing a bunch of tests. She's got some things in her, in her, in her liver, I think in her, in her, is it her liver, Things inside, internally is going on, and they're trying to do a bunch of tests, and so she needs a miracle from the Lord, right? And, and we don't know that anything she's done has caused that, and so she needs a miracle. But there are things that we have done that have caused the things that we need God to heal us from, amen? And a lot of our own problems are because of the things that we do. Praise the Lord. If I eat pizza too late, I'm going to get heartburn. It ain't the devil giving me heartburn. It was the pizza that I shouldn't have ate after 8 o'clock, Amen. And we need, to, we need to recognize that, that merely the consequences of our own actions is the reason why we're going through some of the things that we're going through. If we're going to war effectively, we must separate what is of the flesh from what is of the devil. Praise God. And so many times, that's what we need to realize. And if we stop and we just think, if God's people would just begin to think before they speak, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger, Begin to think and then listen to the Holy Spirit. The Lord will reveal to us what we need to do. Amen? Uh, Before we have a strategy, before we have any strategy for attacking Satan, we must make sure that the the real enemy is not our own carnal nature. And that's the real real battle. I talked a little bit about it last week when uh, they went out to fight the battle of Ai in the book of of Joshua. Ai represents in the... 
in that context of Canaan being the, the, the land that we, in the, in the Old Testament, Canaan was a real land and they were to go into the land and take it. Canaan repre represents the life of the believer. There's going to be struggles and battles in your life as a believer. You're going to have to war and you're going to have to learn to war. David said, teach my hands to war. We have to learn to war, but we also need to recognize and understand who our enemies are. And one of the enemies that they had to face was the, the, the village or the small town of Ai. And when they went up to fight Ai, they were routed and they were defeated. Ai represents the flesh. Let me tell you something. The flesh is the most unruly enemy that you have to overcome. Satan's already been defeated at Calvary. Everything has been put under the subjection of Jesus' feet. Authority. Though Satan has a leash to roam around as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but he's limited in scope and resource. He's a powerful foe for me to try to fight on my own. I can't defeat him in myself. But my greatest enemy is not Satan. He's already been defeated. My greatest enemy is this flesh. <laughs> Amen. My carnality, my carnal side. You ain't angry because you ain't, you ain't got an anger problem because you're Irish. You got an anger problem because you got the devil in you. You got to get the devil. You got a, you got a heart that's not yielded to God. Amen. Uh, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't a, a, a mean person, cause, a hot-headed person because you're a redhead, Tom. Tom's not hot-headed, but it's not nothing to do with your physical characteristics. It's more to do with the, the old sin nature that needs to be crucified. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Where am I at here? Okay. We've got to ask ourselves. Now, listen, I didn't, this, is, this is a quote from this, the book, The Three Battlegrounds. But this is really good. We've got to ask ourselves this question. Are the things oppressing us today the harvest of what, was, what we planted yesterday? Are the things oppressing us today the harvest of what we planted yesterday? Are we going through today because of the, the choices we made yesterday? Now, praise be to God. Our future isn't determined by our past. But in our present, we need to, we need to, we need to deal with our past if we keep running from it. And we need to recognize it. Amen? Amen. If we don't deal with our past, then it'll, it'll, go, it'll carry into our future. But the past has been put under the blood. And the only thing that our past should be is a witness of how good and faithful God is. It's a testimony to the goodness of God. So here's what I want to make, my, my next point. And this is it. We have to, and I said this last week, but we have to learn to agree with our adversary. What do you mean, pastor? We need to agree with the devil on some things. There's some things we need to come into agreement with him. You say, well, why would you say such a thing like that, pastor? Jesus was talking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. He says, agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and, the, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. This parable expresses God's view on human righteousness. And we have an adversary who's our enemy. And he's the accuser of the brethren. And he desires to bring us before the throne of God and accuse us day as often as he can. He's not omnipresent. He can't be all places at all times. But there are times, and I don't know how this works and even why the Lord allows it, but there are times he's before the Father and he's accusing the saints. Because Revelation tells us he's the accuser of the brethren. And what does he do? He, when he brings our, he brings our failures, he brings our faults, he brings our unconfessed sins, and he shows the Lord. He says, you see what they did? You see how they're, they've acted? And he does that before us. And I thought about this in this context. I thought about this because I don't want to take the scripture out of context, but look at the verse itself. He says that you have to agree with your adversary quickly lest you... Be deliver your adversary, deliver you over to the judge. And we talked last week that whenever there's darkness in our heart or darkness in our life, the enemy has legal rights to the darkness. Why? Because he operates in the realm of darkness. And so if I have hate in my heart for somebody, the enemy has access to that area of my life. 
And until I can get forgiveness and, and ask the Lord to forgive me of that and release that to God and let the light of God be shined in that area, Satan will continue to beat me up and cause me to think thoughts about other people and I'll keep buying into his lies. And so any place that the enemy has a- access, any place that we have not uh, taken and crucified, the, f- the areas of the flesh is the same way. And so if we don't agree with him quickly, the Bible says that he'll deliver us before the judge and we'll be thrown into prison. The parable explains God's view of human righteousness. In the narrative, the adversary is the devil, and the judge is God. Satan as our adversary stands as an accuser of the brethren before God, the judge of all. The truth Christ wants us to see is that when we approach God on the basis of our own righteousness, the adversary will always have legal grounds to cast us into prison, to erect strongholds in our life to take us captive in places that he, we, we ought not to let him have, take us into captivity, amen? A prison is a stronghold, and Satan wants us to be stuck, bound, and locked up. And so we have to learn to obey with our adversary quickly, but to, oh, to, 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 to agree with your adversary doesn't mean obey the devil. It doesn't mean he's my Lord. I'm just saying, yeah, in this, in this scenario, you're right. You're not showing your wife a whole lot of love. You know what, Lord? The enemy's right. You know what, Satan? You're right. I ain't showing my wife the love that I need to. God put the love in my heart. Let me love her like you love the church. I haven't treated my neighbor very. You haven't treated your neighbor very good. You've, you've, you know, you've been this. You've been talking bad about. Yeah, you know what? I have been. Instead of trying to justify our actions, let's agree with the enemy and take it to the Lord and let the judge judge us rightly because why? If the enemy is the accuser of the brethren, we have an advocate. Our lawyer is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he goes before us. And then what he says is when we confess our sin or our, uh, uh, the thing that we've fallen into or the thing that has us ca- held captive, when we confess it, then the, then the advocate can say, well, I paid for that. I paid a great price for that. Praise God. You know, to confess means to say the same thing. And when we confess our, our shortcomings, our sins, our failures, we're saying, telling God what he already knows. That's why we don't have to be worried about telling the Lord what we've done if we've done a thing. The key is not to argue with the devil about our own righteousness because before God, your righteousness is unacceptable. Don't justify your righteousness. And I won't justify my righteousness before God because what? It's unacceptable. What does the Bible say in Isaiah 64, 6? Our righteousness is like filthy rags. That's why Isaiah, the great prophet, would say in Isaiah, I think, chapter 6, the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple. And he begins to describe this, this marvelous, magnificent, awesome, terrible uh, uh, vision that he has of the glory in the presence of God. Now, something I, I've heard this talk before, and I always thought that this is that's pretty interesting. And I, I think it's I think it could be very I think it could be said in context and could be accurate. Do you know that Isaiah had already been a prophet to the nation? He'd been a prophet to the nation for for several years already. He'd already written in the first five chapters prophecies concerning the nations and the nation and the people of God. And then in chapter 6, he has an experience, a revelation of God that he's never had before. This is the one thing I know about the Lord. The Lord desires to reveal more of himself to his people. And it's not that God, there's more of God to be, that God can add more to himself. He's complete and whole. But he wants to add more. Of, he wants to give us greater understanding of who he is and give us greater revelation of who he is. And that comes through continued submission and surrender to God. And so Isaiah has this vision, man, of glory and presence of God. And what does Isaiah do in the presence of God? He says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah in the moment doesn't justify his actions and say the people are these wicked people. Lord, see them, see how bad they are. He says, no, I'm, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm unjustified, God. I'm, I'm I'm unholy, I'm unrighteous, just like the rest of this, this, this perverse generation is. Because no matter how good I am and no matter how I, much I get it right in myself, it's not good enough before God. 
That's why I need, I need, I need someone to go for me on my behalf. I'm going to get to that in just a second. But there's another interesting fact about this story. And watch this. I, I, I've heard this preached before, and I thought, wow, this is, this is really, this is really a, uh, a pretty good interpretation, I believe. But, this, but, but you can make the connection here. Watch this. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. King Uzziah was, started out as a godly king. He was, a, he, was a, he was like a renaissance man. He was, he, he was a builder. He was a, strategi- he was a strategist. I mean, he, he, was, he was a king's king. I mean, he had a lot of gifts and abilities. And in his life, he accomplished a lot of things for God. But at one point, he became proud and arrogant to the point that he thought he could take the liberty to go into the Holy of Holies and offer incense before the Lord. And the Lord said only the high priest could do that. Only the priesthood could have access to those places under the system that, of the law. And Uzziah thought in himself, I'm good enough that I can do this and I can go in before the presence of God. He will understand. And the Bible says as they tried to stop Uzziah that the Lord struck him with leprosy because of his pride and his self-righteousness. And Uzziah represents in an essence, the flesh. Whenever there's areas of our life that we, we bring before the Lord to be crucified, the Lord will reveal more of himself to us. Every area that the, that the Lord reveals more of himself to us, then we are we bring more into the likeness and image of Christ. And that's why it's important for us to always walk humbly before the Lord and not ever become proud or arrogant. It's easy to begin to read your own mail and think, hey, I'm all that in a bag of chips. And really, you ain't but, but about a half a bag of chips. <laughs> what, did, what, did, what did President Biden say? If, uh, chip, chip inflation? We were, you know, have, anyway, I'll leave that alone. I, a lot of us are living in that realm of the world. Amen. But we have this idea of much more about ourselves. And so we have to be very careful. And so the year when flesh dies of our life, then God has more access to areas in our life. Because the one thing that God won't go against is our free will. God's will will happen, but he, he'll allow us to do what we want to do. And we might miss out on a lot of great blessings of the Lord. Or we might have to go around the mountain more times than what the Lord had originally intended for us. Because we couldn't get that thing crucified in our life. I'm talking to myself right now. No matter how much you defend or justify ourselves, we, no matter how much we defend or justify ourselves, we know innerly that often the accusations of the devil have morsels of truth in them. Our salvation is not based upon what we do, but upon who Jesus becomes to us. Christ himself is our righteousness. It's not a righteousness of my own. Satan tries to deceive us by getting us to focus on our own righteousness. If he can make me think that I'm okay and I'm good enough, then he can get a foothold in my life and have access in my life. And he can play and, and he, can, he can really, and, and we gotta, be, we gotta be mindful of these things because it's so easy to do. Why did Joshua lose the battle of AI? Because he put too much confidence in the flesh. They had just won a battle with, with Jericho, which represents the world. Yeah. Only Christ said, I've overcome the world. And yet when it came to fight AI, what happened? The Bible says that they went down there and they thought they could overcome this because this was a small community and they only needed a handful of people to do it. When we put too much confidence in the flesh, even the smallest enemies in our life will rout us. Because no amount of the flesh is able to overcome our enemy. And, and it's not about willpower. It's not about positive thinking. It's about surrender to God. I can, be, I can have as much discipline in myself to do as much as I want to do. But at the end of the day, the flesh is going to win out. I'm going to give in to it at some point. Amen? Praise God. I'm almost there. Maybe. <laughs> but 
The more we recognize that Jesus alone is our righteousness, the less the adversary can assault us in the area of our failings. The focus has to be on Jesus and his grace and not on our sin. Even when we do fall short, we bring it to the Lord and we confess it, but we thank him for his, his, his salvation. We thank him for his forgiveness. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to trip us up through temptation. We succumb to the flesh, and then he wants to beat us down with condemnation and bring us into captivity and into bondage. But what the Lord says I want you to do, I want you to bring your failure, your faults, your, your shame, uh, your guilt, and I want you to bring it to me. And I want you to focus on what I'm able to do for you in that moment. Because when I give you my righteousness, that filthy righteousness of yours is done with. Amen. Amen. And too often the enemy, we want to focus on the fault that we do or the faults of others that other people do. And not enough focus on the grace of Jesus and on, the, on, the, on Jesus himself. And that's how the enemy keeps us in condemnation. Here's what I believe. Conviction of the Holy Ghost, what does the Bible say? He convicts us to write about righteousness. Conviction stirs our heart to focus more on God. Condemnation stirs our heart to focus more on what we did. And God doesn't want us to walk in condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that if you do fall short, that you're just to blow it off and say, well, God's already forgiven me for that. No, you need, you, need, you need to repent of the things that you do. And you need to ask God, confess the things that you do. And I need to confess the things I do so that the Lord can begin to work in me and work those things out of me. Amen? But not live in condemnation. Praise God. The words of the Apostle Paul. This is what I, I love this about the Apostle Paul. This is what he writes. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy, he says, to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I did all those things. And, I don't, and I'm not worthy to be counted as one of God's sons. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But for the grace of God, go I. And I can go forward in, in confidence and in boldness, right? And in, in, the, in the confidence of the Lord, step out from the shadow of satanic assault and stand in the righteousness and brightness of the Father's love. That's what we need to do. Satan wants to keep us in condemnation and darkness. we got to step out of that, right? And how do we do that? Through humility. We do that through humility. Submit yourself to God and ask the Lord or ask for Christ's love and forgiveness to replace our weak and perfect areas of our life. If the enemy tells us we don't love God and we ain't, God, help me in the areas where I don't love enough and show me how to love better. Man, I agree with your adversary quickly and then he has nothing over you. Praise God. I have been, let me tell you something. Have you ever been baited? The enemy loves to bait us, right? I've told stories about how the enemy's baited me before. I, you got to pray for me. I, the, I, the one area where I really struggle, I'm just being transparent, is when my wife tries to tell me how to drive. I know I talked about it a minute ago. But it's the one area. I got a lot of grace for a lot of areas, but that one area just bothers me. And we were driving down the road the other day, and that thought came to my mind. She's going to start telling you how to drive. And I said to myself, I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to buy, buy the bait. I'm going to keep my composure. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to, and, if, and if she gives me good advice, then I'm going to take it. Because usually it's good advice. My wife's a better driver than I am. I'm going to admit it right now before the congregation. She's in the nursery. She's not in here. So don't tell her I told you this. All right. We'll edit this out of the sermon. I'm driving down the road the other day. And I hear this little voice. She's going to start telling you how to drive. And I, I'm not going to take the bait. I kept saying, I'm not going to take the bait. And the more I say that, the more this feeling of like anticipation for it to come. Began to rise. <laughs> and sure enough, she, and she's trying. Now, we've had this conversation. I said, honey, just let me drive. And so she's looking at me, and she's looking at the speedometer, and she's looking at the road, and all of a sudden, she's, and I, when she looked over, I know what she's doing. I, I, out of the corner of my eye, I know what she's doing. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, keep it together here. <laughs> and she says... 
What's the speed limit in this section of the road? <laughs> and my response was, well, you know, honey, I really don't know. I think it's, what is it? Would have been the right. I should have agreed with my, no, not my adversary. I should have agreed with my, I said, I said, I said, I'm going with the flow of traffic. I didn't know what it was. Instead of asking, what is it? I need to slow down. I was going like five over. I said, I'm just going with the flow of traffic. Well, you're supposed to go to speed. Oh, I know I'm supposed to, but the, the traffic's going, I'm going. And I just tried to justify my wrong act. I was breaking the law. But I tried to justify my action. And the enemy tried to set me up because he knows where my goat is. If he knows where your goat is, he's going to get your goat. Amen. He set me up. And I took the bait. Hook, line, and sinker, and about a mile down the road, I'm thinking to myself, you idiot. Why, if you would have just kept your mouth shut and said, you're right, and just been quiet, now you wouldn't be feeling defeated. Now you wouldn't have to worry about getting no sugars on the jaw later. <laughs> it's funny, but, it's, but that ain't that the way that it works in any area of our life. Hallelujah. And we just need to understand. We got to step out of what, and, and when the enemy comes, we got to submit ourselves to God. And we got to receive the Lord's love and forgiveness, even when we do blow it. There's a, there is a multitude of grace, grace upon grace. No matter what the condemnation the enemy brings you, us, the ex, no matter what the, now watch this. This is good. I got I to get this out. Come on, Tom. Praise God. Praise God. No matter what the condemnation the enemy brings us, no matter what the condemnation, I wrote this down wrong. Let me, let me try to get this out. No matter what the condemnation the enemy brings, use the accusation as a reminder. There it is. No matter what the condemnation the enemy brings, use the accusation as a reminder. And what is that? That we have... We are not standing before a throne of judgment, but rather a throne of grace that enables us to boldly draw near to God for help. When we justify ourselves, we have no right to stand before that grace of th that throne room of grace. But if I'll submit to the Lord and I'll use the accusation of the enemy to draw me closer to God for his help, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Look at this word confidence, what it means. It means boldness. And it's defined as the trait of being willing to undertake activities that involve risk or danger, especially that involve being honest and straightforward in an attitude and speech. I don't come to the throne room of grace in the time of trouble and say, are you hearing what the devil's saying about me? He's accusing me of these things. Do something about it, God. No, God, I come to you, Lord, and I say right now, Lord, he might, what he's saying, there is some truth to that. Not everything that he's saying is true. I'm not going to believe his lies about the condemnation and there's no hope and you won't forgive me. But Lord, I do admit to that right there. I did lose my cool in the car with my wife. And Lord, please, in this time of moment, I need your help. I need your strength. Forgive me. And in that moment, I can talk straight forward to God. And what does the Bible say? That Satan, that Satan has no right or authority or claim in my life in that moment. And that what do I receive? I receive the grace and mercy of God. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Hallelujah. And the enemy would have you think that God's desire is to judge you and destroy your life because of things you've done. If you'll but confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. If you'll but humble yourself, a broken and contrite spirit, he won't deny. Hallelujah. If you'll but just come before him boldly and say with, a, with, with courage and confidence, Lord, I need you. It's not confidence in myself, but it's confidence in the one who I stand before. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. 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 I'm, I'm, I am landing this bird. I am landing this baby. The vital key to overcoming the devil is humility. Remember, he hates, he's, he's afraid of humility. Because if I'm humble... He's got no place in me. 
But if I'm egotistical and prideful, he can work with that. Humility is the key to overcoming the devil. To humble yourself is to refuse to defend your image. Listen, we are corrupt and full of sin in our old nature. Yet we have a new nature which has been created in the likeness of Christ. Ephesians 4, 24, and to, and to put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We're to put on the new self. Amen. The enemy wants to clothe us with heaviness. Clothe us with condemnation. Clothe us with guilt. And the flesh wants us to clothe ourselves with self-righteousness and justification of self and, and pity of self. Amen. But we're to put off all those garments and put on the likeness of Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be clothed in His beauty. Be clothed in His righteousness. And be clothed in His holiness. And we do that through humility. Because He resists the proud. But He gives grace to the humble. The humble can come before His his, his throne room boldly in the time of trouble. Think about it in the terms of this just real quick. And I promise, I, I'm, I got one last thing to share. I'm almost done. Well, a couple things. But anyway, I'm almost done. Here we go. Watch this. Watch this. The book of Esther. Esther's a great book. Quit looking at the clock. It don't mean nothing. All right. <laughs> Praise God. We used to joke all the time. If you're a Baptist, we say, we go, don't worry. We ain't going to beat the Baptist to church anyway. So that's not just a bad joke. I shouldn't have brought that up. All right. Pentecostals like to go all day. That was why they would joke like that. Esther was the queen. And God had appointed Esther to be the queen. And it was a crazy circumstance which she came to be the queen. She was a daughter of captivity. And God brought her out of captivity. He placed her in this place. And, and, and Mordecai, her uncle, says, you were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. And in the moment when, the, when there was dire And Esther needed mercy for her people. And she needed grace extended. The Bible says that she went before the king and she approached him in a time of trouble. And she 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 wasn't confident completely that when she went before him that he would answer her request. Because if she went into his presence unannounced, the Bible says that she the king had the right to dis to uh to banish her. She could even be killed by going into the presence of the king but without being invited. And the Bible says in a moment after praying and fasting and having the people pray and fast, she goes before the king. And when he lifted his scepter, the Bible says that that was his acceptance. If he didn't, that means that she was out of order. And so the Bible says when she goes in and she bursts into the presence of the king unannounced that he lifted his scepter. 2,000 years ago, Jesus lifted his arms. And he extended them on a cross. He let them nail him down so that now you can come boldly before his presence. You are invited. You're always invited to come before him. Amen. You don't have to take a chance. You don't have to think maybe it will, maybe it won't. Every single time if you come humbly before the Lord, you're going to be received in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. I hope you got a good one, Pastor Tom. Hallelujah. So we can agree with our adversary about the condition of our flesh. We must not limit this principle of humming ourselves only when we are involved in spiritual warfare. We need to practice humility. The Bible says that we're to walk in humility. We're to put on, as God's chosen people, humility. We're to have a humble mind, another passage says. Another place says all of us are to be clothed with humility. We have to practice humility. Why? Because humility builds up spiritual defense around our soul, prohibiting strife and competition and many of life's irritations from stealing your peace and my peace. If I practice humility, guess what? The enemy doesn't have a place in me. And I can practice humility in the seasons when things are very competitive and when the ego tries to raise its head. If I'm walking in humility, that has no place in me. And guess what? He can't rob me of my peace. When I'm in competition with somebody, I don't have no peace. I'm hoping I can beat this person or win out in the end. If I don't have humility in a, in a moment and there's, there's, there's strife, guess what's going to happen? That strife's going to rob me of my peace. It won't rob me of my salvation, but it'll rob me of the very thing that God has promised me is my peace. But if I'll humble myself before God and trust Him with the outcome, and we need that in this season, 
And we're not going to take a poll of who we're going to vote for. But right now, the church needs peace to know that God is the one that's on the throne. Yeah. Hallelujah. And trust Him with the outcome. We need to trust the Lord in all these areas in our life. And I'm closing with this. God's, God humbles us for our own good. If we're not willing to humble ourselves, the Lord will humble us. But he does it because he loves us. But watch this. When we humble ourselves, God hears our prayers. When we humble ourselves, God saves us. When we humble ourselves, he preserves our lives. For those who are humble, they become wise. Proverbs 11, 22. God cares for the humble. God will exalt the humble. We have to be humble in dealing with others. We have to humble ourselves before God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. How do we, Lord, move? How do we move, Lord? By your Spirit. We are more than conquerors. And we have an adversary. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. He wants to gain access to our thought life that's uncrucified. But through humility today, God, we can crucify the un those thoughts, taking them captive. We can crucify the flesh, nailing it to the cross, identifying with Jesus. It starts by just saying to the Lord, Lord, I agree. I have been prideful. I've been lustful. I've been greedy. I've had anger in my heart. I've been complacent. I've been lazy, slothful. I've been talking about my brother or sister. I haven't bared with one another in love. I've held on to offense. Wherever, whatever fits in the blank. Whatever fits in the blank. I've walked, allowed condemnation to rule my thought life of things that I did before I came to Christ. And even though I know I'm forgiven, Lord, I can't let go of those things because I'm so ashamed. Whatever it is, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Agree with the adversary. I have done those things. But God, I come to you and I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind, over that area in my life, over my heart. I plead the blood of Jesus. Wash me by the washing of your word. going to wait on the Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Surely the presence of the Lord is moving in this house. Changing minds. Regulating thoughts. Convicting hearts. Opening eyes and ears. To 
see the goodness of the Lord and to hear what thus saith the Lord. Hey. We have to practice humility. Let us start right now in this service. Lord, I need you, I need you, I need you, Jesus. I need you more than yesterday. I need you more than two hours ago. I need you, I need you, I need you, Jesus. Open my eyes to see. Lord, I want to crucify the flesh. I want to die to self, Lord. Show me how to do it, God. I need you, I need you, I need you. Show me how to receive your forgiveness and to believe it and to walk in it, Lord. And show me how to forgive others, Lord. And walk in it, Lord. Oh, I need it. I need you. 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 Woo. Man, I just... I just want to wait on the Lord, but I just believe right now the Lord is calling us to humble ourselves before Him in this moment. In reverence. Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. All you got to do is come. Come with confidence this morning that the Lord's going to hear you. You're not coming, making, the, hoping that it might happen, that it might just work out. But you can come with confidence this morning that when you come before the Lord with a humble heart, He's going to hear you. Not confidence in your ability to say the right things, but just confidence in Him that He's able to tell you the right thing, to speak the right thing. Woo! Come on, sing it.